My name is Era, and I'm the host of the Tamil Creator Podcast. I chat with creators from all over the world to share their stories and discuss hot topics in a way that I hope inspires, educates, and entertains you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Tamil Creator. I'm your host, Era. Today, I have Karthi Subramaniam, and he is the founder of Litz Hot Sauce and co-founder of Malaysian street food company, Bungus, with his uh, mom, Siva. So, Karthi, thanks for uh, jumping on the podcast. Hey, Ara, thanks for having me. I'm uh, really happy to be here. As a lover of food, as many of us are, I'm excited to talk about, and I love business, so it's kind of, you're like in the best of both worlds. I know it's a tough industry to kind of run a business in, but, uh, you know, it's marrying two things I like, so I think I'm going to enjoy this conversation. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, kind of where my head was at when I started as well. Yeah. Um, so I like to kind of start from the beginning as like a father and just understanding how different decisions kind of can create inflection points in somebody's life to kind of make them who they are today. So for you, um, how did your childhood or formative teenage years play a part in you becoming an entrepreneur in the food space with now, you know, not one company, but two? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, for in terms of an entrepreneur um, in general and becoming that, um, I grew up uh, watching my mom run her her business. Um, she had a hair salon in Parkdale for about 15 years. Um, she ran that on her own. Um, back home in Malaysia, my middle brother, um, he had his uh, shops from when he was uh, in his mid-20s, I believe. Um, he, still, he still has a couple shops um, running today still. So for like in it and and then like even further back my grandma she she also runs her own business as well um in like the the washroom business in uh, malaysia uh because a lot of the public washrooms you have to pay for um so she she runs uh that um so there's definitely been that entrepreneurial spirit in my family um and just seeing them do it seeing the independence that they gained um, seeing them like take the risks that they did to be able to run and open their businesses and um, you know continue to uh, learn from learn from their experiences uh, go through all the hurdles that they did and um, yeah that that was a big inspiration for why I became an entrepreneur I, I really liked um, what they were able to do with that and it really showed me that it, it's possible to do um, so that's what got me into it. In terms of the food space, I've always loved food. Um, I, you know, as as long as I can remember, as 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 far back as probably like, I think eight or nine years old, I started just experimenting in the kitchen. Um, my mom, she was working like two three jobs at one point, um, and it's just uh, my mom and myself here. Um, so growing up i didn't want to burden her with having to come home and cook as well for me so i would uh you know cook whatever i could uh learn by watching her by you know picking up like easy recipes and like uh you know it could be like packet ramen and, and it started off as that and then just going from there um so those uh those aspects of my life definitely played a big part um in uh becoming an entrepreneur in the food space what was it like? Did you grow up in Malaysia? Or did you grow up in Canada? I grew up in Canada. Um, I came here when I was four, uh, in '93. Um, and yeah, I've I've grown up in Canada ever since. I I go back every so often, but um, yeah, I've mostly been in Canada with my mom. What's uh, Malaysia like? I mean, I've been to Singapore. I've heard Malaysia is somewhat similar, but like for those of us who've never kind of traveled there, like, what is it like? It's amazing. Um, so uh, think tropical weather um, mixed with city, mixed with like countryside as well. Like you can see the countryside from the city. Um, lots and lots of food, lots of diversity in food. So um, and diversity in general. So there's um, there's a few uh, main ethnicities that make up um, Malaysia's population. Uh, one being uh, the Chinese population, another being Indian, um, both from like uh, like Tamil as well as like Hindi speaking Indians. Um, there's a, obviously like the Malay population. Um, so you get you get the best of all worlds when it comes to their foods. You get you know like a it's it's truly like a melting pot. That so um, 
yeah, like it, I would def highly recommend for, uh, if anybody hasn't visited to to pay a visit to Malaysia. It's uh, it's it's a really good spot, um, and you can have all that really good food for pretty cheap. Cool. Yeah, I would love to try Malaysian food. The thing that always um, uh, not screws me over, but limits me in a way is because it happened in Singapore as well. Is I have a shellfish allergy, and there's so many things that use uh, like okay. um, you know uh, shrimp paste or like yeah, oyster yeah, sauce. Blood, so yeah. I gotta always ask. I know shrimp paste is huge, and like I know like a lot of Singaporean and Malaysian food. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I, I guess for you as well, I mean, I know you have multiple, like, you know, we talked about Litz and um, Bunga. So why don't we start off with, you know, Litz first, because I think that was your first business. So um, what kind of what was the aha moment or like that that thing that kind of got you starting that business? And how did that whole thing turn from an idea into your first sale? Um, It was kind of coincidence. Uh, it, it happened all of a sudden. Uh, so I was recording a video of making a pepper sauce, uh, one of my friend's dad's recipes um i was i was just like recording it um on my personal instagram account this was like way back when like we barely had most of the features that we have today but um just recording uh making that and i've got i was getting messages uh from friends and family asking how much for a bottle uh where do i get it things like that and at that time i was um a bit unfulfilled at my full-time job um so i it, that was the light bulb moment i was like okay let me let me try doing this and uh see where it goes and worst case if um it doesn't if, if it doesn't grow as a business i'm gonna continue you know making making hot sauce uh making spicy food and just continuing to do this for myself anyways um regardless of the business so that's that was the aha moment um i also for a long time before that the idea of having like a homemade hot sauce on the market was always there because I was getting really tired of going out to restaurants to take out spots, asking for hot sauce. And I would get like, you know, the Franks, the Tabasco, the Sriracha is really, it, it became generic. Um, and a lot of those sauces are heavily vinegar based. Um, they have preservatives and chemicals and stuff like that. So I wanted to introduce what I grew up on, which was like the all natural hot um, pepper sauces um, and, and, actually includes flavor uh, versus just spice, um, which I saw a lack of in the market. So those two things kind of tied together. And that's how I, that's how I began. Obviously whipping up a, a hot sauce for yourself for personal use, because, you know, it, it was lacking in the, the, the spots you went out to mm -hmm. is different from, I mean, at some point you, you can do that up to a certain point, but did you notice there was a point when you kind of had to go from making, making it maybe homemade to um thinking about working with a co-packer or, or like something on a bigger scale to kind of scale it or like um or maybe you find a way around that i'm curious yeah 100 percent um my kitchen was really small uh obviously i didn't have all the equipment that i needed in order to scale the business um so as the months progressed and i got and i continuously um got positive feedback on the hot sauces I realized that the bigger I got, the more volume that I'd have to produce and the less space that I had at home. So I started researching, um, you know, how do how do the bigger companies do it? How do they uh, produce at scale? So I started learning about co-packers and um, uh, start uh, research like where I could I could uh, pack at a larger volume um, within Toronto. So started off from going to a bottling company to get like proper bottles um you know i started off with like six cases each case had like 12 bottles um went to a production place that was nearby my um nearby my old place uh, um fortunately and was making i i went from making probably like six to 12 liters at a time just using like multiple blenders um to making 100 liters so even that was like a pretty big leap um, just in the process and the volume alone. And then in September of 2021, we made our next big jump, uh, which is the place that we're using right now. And now we're producing each each flavor. We're producing at minimum 300 liters. Wow, that's wild. 300 liters. Um, yeah, that, that translates to about like 1,800 bottles. Interesting. And I mean, I've, like, I, I'm, I love business. So like there's a lot, ton of questions I want to kind of ask you, but... 
I guess number one is like, is this something you put together yourself or is it something you kind of start to kind of do on your own? How did that, and how'd you make that decision? In terms of like, uh, in terms of like turning it into a full scale business or? Yeah, or like even like uh, in terms of, you know, is it, do you have other founders or do you have, have you hired a team or like, how are, how are you kind of doing this now? So now, thankfully I've started forming a team um, it, it was, it's actually been pretty recent. It's been just as of this year, I've started forming that team. I have someone doing, uh, taking care of sales and admin. I have most recently someone um, doing the finances and someone uh, taking care of like marketing and graphic design. Um, but for this is, this is now, um, it, we hit our fifth year in March of this year. But for the most part before that, it was kind of just, uh, the solopreneur journey. And then I had my girlfriend uh, available to help where she could um, support me at like events and like uh, production runs and things like that. Um, but she was also working full time as well. So yeah, it was uh, mostly a solopreneur journey up until pretty much just this year. And I know that recent, oh, actually, before I get to this, so, you know, you, you went from, you talked about scaling from like, you know, a few liters to like, you know, 300 liters, or like a yeah. sauce or whatever it was. Um, obviously you're not getting to that point unless you're selling. So, um, and I think this was your first business. So I'm always curious as a fellow entrepreneur, like, how did you get your first sale? Um, and you know, was it like B2C initially and are you kind of getting into the B2B world and like, how are you doing sales in general? Yeah. Um, so my, my first ever sale, uh, would have been from like friends and family. This is like before I had like proper labels and everything on, on like a retail shelf. Um, so it was coming from uh, friends and family, um, uh, just like e-transfer the funds. Um, I started a Shopify website um, about like uh, like a few months after I I, I had started. I I because I if I was starting a business, my thought was let's try to make it as official as possible from the get go uh, versus backtracking like a few years down the road. Um, so I, I created the website, offered uh, shipping through Shopify and um, local pickup. Uh, people could pick up that. Um, at that time, it was my workplace, um, which was thankfully like downtown. So it's uh, a bit convenient for a, a lot of people. Um, and then about a year after we started, I believe it was December 2019, um, we partnered with our first retailer. Um, which was Chili Chili's in Ottawa, and they have two shops. And uh, yeah, they took they took a shot on us. Um, really helped us to formalize our product and make sure that we had the right um, elements on our label. Uh, make sure like we, you know, we were thinking about like the uh, the correct price point and the wholesaling and things like that. That really introduced me to that side of things in the B two B world. Um, so that was our first retailer, and now. We are at about 36 retailers, um, not including one national retailer that we're in. That's amazing. I mean, I know for you, it's probably like you're probably stuck in the day to day of like just kind of getting things done to grow your business. But uh, as someone that kind of has to do sales for their like business as well, it's uh, props to you. I mean, it's not easy getting into retail. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's awesome. And like this episode is sponsored by Nobody. That's right, nobody. So if you could be kind enough to hit that subscribe button, that would mean a lot to me. Are you, is there like a certain type of retail uh, client or that you're trying to focus on? Like would a Whole Foods or like, you know, like a, one of the big grocery chains be a potential client or would this be more of like starting in like boutique places for now? So it's, it's uh, for the most part of our journey, it's been like the independent stores and like the specialty stores, um, the ones that sell like, uh artisanal goods so not necessarily like if, if a store like their um if, if we'll we'll look at we'll look at their shelves first so if if a store uh hot sauce aisle they were carrying like just mostly the generic brands and maybe their price point's like going to be like five or six dollars we're likely that's not that's likely not the fit for us um because our product is a bit more premium higher price point um, so that would be like the first rule. Uh, so when we're looking at other shops, we were looking at stores that sold like local goods or, um, uh, the local goods was like a main thing for us. Um, we wanted, 
we wanted stores that like supported local brands like ours um and then we got into our uh, a national retailer um in in september 2021 that that was also the reason why we moved to the larger pull packer to um fulfill the uh the orders that they were they they got us to and then now we are at the stage of approaching more national retailers. So I'm hoping within the next year or so, you're going to see lit products at, you know, the Whole Foods, the Metro, the Sobeys and so on. Um, that's that's kind of where I want it to get to. Uh, but yeah, it started at the artisanal goods. And I, I guess that you kind of answered that question. Like, how do you approach these stores? Like, I, I guess it's individual stores, or I, I guess you talked about the bigger ones, but individual stores, I guess, before you got into the bigger scale, Mm -hmm. like how did you pitch them like did you just find the owner's email he called them just walk them in the store like how did you pitch them luckily for the first i think the first like 10 stores that we got they actually approached us um uh they like instagram and the internet is is wild like just the amount of presence that you can have even from like minimal posting and minimal marketing skills um they were able to find us and uh they like we we talked through the buyers and the owners and then we got in but every store has its own approach so you know some stores i'll i'll email the owner some stores i'll phone uh i'll dial in but the one the the approach that i find works the best usually is um, going in person with some samples uh talking to the owner tell them your story uh tell them what your product is about and like explain just having that physical connection and like, you know, um, being able to meet the owner um, face to face, it makes a huge difference. So that's what has been working for us for the past uh, couple of years. Uh, I'm curious, I guess the first thing that popped in mind as I thought of your sauces is like, I don't know why Nando's or like some kind of food brand where it's like, it's already this thing like, you know, Nando's has like, there's like 10 different sauces you can choose from. So like, why can't this be one of those or like some other food item where it's like, obviously sauce is not sauce without something in kind of Mm -hmm. you know, go with so have you ever thought about that i mean it might be a dumb question i just this came to my to br my brain right now so just thinking about that yeah I def I, i've definitely thought about that um like ha we the the way that i even like market my product is that it complements your food and enhances it versus overtakes and 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 burns your tongue off um we we wanted it to be not a novelty product that you look at it as like a challenge of like, how much can you take? Um, so like with all the flavors that I've created, whenever, when I was, ex when I was experimenting with the recipes, the first thought was what kind of pair food pairings would go well with each flavor. Um, and that's kind of how I formulated each one um, in terms of, you know, uh, competing with like the Nando's and those other brands we're getting there um but it does it does take a while like uh cpg in general it's, it's a highly saturated market and then on top of that hot sauce in general like there's thousands and thousands of different hot sauces so it's finding it's it's interesting finding different ways to be innovative and just uh standing out from the crowd i guess like you said in the saturated market i guess the um non tan or i guess the non-tangible thing which is story or brand i guess becomes really important then exactly yeah I, you know, I know that you're kind of building up this business kind of as you're working full time. And I know I think you recently announced somewhere that you were leaving your full time job to kind of pursue this as well as Bungus as well, which we'll get to. Yeah. Um, for there's a lot of people kind of in, you know, that kind of were in your world. I know you're kind of being able to pursue it very soon. Um, how did you balance having like a full time job with kind of building up, you know, your business on the side? Because, you know, time is time and attention is really hard. And I think yeah. with those things, you're able to kind of grow everything, but obviously full-time job gives you stability. So you need both. And sometimes there's cross learnings as well, but how did you just manage your time? And like, how did you manage to kind of grow lits to, you know, what it is now while having a full-time job? To be honest, it was pretty chaotic. <laughs> um, I was like pretty much every spare minute I got um, outside of my full-time job, I spent on lits um, and then, spent on uh, Bunkus once uh, that started up as well. And as I was scaling up and like there was like um, times where there was market events and like busier seasons, like the the holidays for like, um, like especially like between like mid November to like mid January, those retail months, those were like probably the hardest. Um, I 
wouldn't say it was like a healthy way of balancing it for sure because there was like plenty of times where it was like before work lits then then work then then lits afterwards or in between i was like answering uh emails so it was like it was it was it got pretty difficult at at some times um but i made it work uh to an extent luckily i was a store manager for um uh, about nine years um where i was working so it allowed me to create my own schedule so there was i usually tried to coordinate in a way that if i had like a market event that day i was off for my schedule like as much as possible if i could um do that but uh, there was some times where i would have to pick and choose and as much as i wanted to choose lit this thing that i'm creating obviously i have a full-time job i'm obligated to that um so there was there was sometimes where i would have to pass on opportunities uh for my businesses because i had to uh be there at my full time um was there anything you noticed that you kind of had to give not give up but like um sacrifice so was it like i i've a common answers i hear is like you know sometimes the social life sometimes your health um like what what was it for you sacrificing was the sleep and yeah social life for sure um plenty of times like i uh, my weekends were right off, uh, summers, uh, right off. Um, they kind of still are, uh, because those are like the busiest, uh, months for me, especially because of the market. How does like, how do your friends and family kind of, I mean, I think people theoretically know that you're running a business and like, like, yeah, like, I think they understand the idea, but I think the reality is something you don't really understand unless you're in in that world. Yeah. So, um, do they kind of get like sometimes why you're not able to make it or like, um or you've had to explain it to them like how do you kind of reconcile that or at least kind of ensure you have those relationships there <laughs> as you yeah. kind of this baby yeah, yeah it's um it's been difficult at times there's there's times where like i i try to make make time as much as possible uh to spend with my friends and family um there's other times where i have to at the end of the day like if i'm not there for my uh business at this current stage um as and before when i didn't have anybody on my team um the business just wouldn't run so that's where i really had to like pick and choose and i was like okay like if i'm not there it's not running it's not open um nobody else is going to cover for me so i kind of have to choose that if i'm continuing to grow that business so there's been times where i've had to miss out on like um you know some important events like birthdays and things like that but for the most part, I try to plan accordingly so that if it is like a bigger event, like let's say like a like my a lot of my friends have been getting married recently. So um, for for weddings, I will always you, you always you, it's not like you'll know only last minute that somebody's getting married. You'll know months ahead. So for for something like that, I can plan accordingly. But because the business as well is like sporadic, there there might be someone that messages me for um, a last minute vendor space in the same week and i have to decide whether i can make that or not um so when it comes to those times they're my friends and family they they kind of know where my head at, head is at and they're understanding that i am likely not a guaranteed spot at the event um because i have the business to attend to and then i guess you know like i said you recently kind of were pursuing entrepreneurship full time but mm -hmm. you know you had one business i think growing one business is hard enough but you decided to do something remarkable. You started another business. <laughs> uh, and I think it's called Bungus, right? Bungus? Bungus. 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 Yeah. Um, with your mom. Obviously, that's amazing yeah. to kind of start something with your mom. But, you know, wh what made you decide to even take on more responsibility by starting a second business? <laughs> Wild. is <laughs> I, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody, to be honest. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty tough. Um, and it was a big reason why I left my full time because at that point when I already introduced the second business, I just, I couldn't handle three things all at once, all basically full time. What, what got me to start that was, so I, I didn't have, Bunkus is still relatively new. It, we've only recently passed like the year mark. Um, but we did one event and it went really well. We like, we sold out within, I think like an hour and a half. And that was like, oh snap, like there's. Obviously, like people are liking what uh, what we're cooking. There's a need for it with bunkers, especially like there was um, there was more of a need for it and like the niche 
in the market for it because there is not that much Malaysian cuisine in Toronto in general. Um, there's some, honestly, I've talked to people that don't even know where Malaysia is and like as a country. So, um, if there is Malaysian food, there's it's it's in the suburbs. There's only a cup a handful of spots that are in downtown. So, but and I felt that struggle gr um, growing up for the most part without a car. If you're if you don't have a car, you're rarely gonna be able to. You're rarely gonna travel like an hour and a half just to go to these restaurants. And I was missing the food a lot. And there's such a diversity in the food. And the fact that Toronto as a diverse food scene didn't have as many um, Malaysian options, it was it was just I, I, I saw a huge gap there. And um, there there are other Malaysians in Toronto with the same kind of pain point. And I met them. I, I only recently met a lot of those Malaysians like just last year. And we were discussing it and we were talking about, uh, you know, we all the biggest thing that we miss about back home is the food. Um, and we're all saying like, you know, we, I wish there was another, I wish there was more options. I wish there was more options. So that's really where the idea came to start up Bunkus. My mom has been wanting to start it up for quite a while. She's, um, she's, she's cooked for all her life. She's, uh, fallen. She's been a, she's been a cook at like, um, our local temples and things like that. And she really wanted to start it for a long time, wanted me to help her with like the marketing and the actual like business side of things. But it was already like overwhelming for me with lits and my full time. Um, when I did that event and saw how well it went, I was like, okay, this might be a way that I can actually transition this um, while keeping enough income for me to be able to survive off. Well, I think you described that problem of, you know, you talked about their Malaysians and they had that, you know, uh, food is associated with that feeling of home. You think of Jollibee's. I think Jollibee's became a monster success because of that same thing with the Filipino community, right? Yeah. Where they go everywhere, Philip. Because I think with in in the Philippines, I think their biggest export is their people to different parts of the world for like various jobs. So, um, so I guess in terms of with Bungus, uh, bu Bungus, 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 right? Bungus, Bungus, Bungus. <laughs> got to get that. First of all, like where does that name come from? And number two, like, um, what made you decide it with, I know your mom had this like dream for a while, but what made you decide to go into business with her? Because supporting somebody doing a business and being in business with somebody that is your family are two different things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just want to hear about that. Did you know that every time you left a five out of five review for this podcast, a Tamil parent lets their child pursue a career in the creative arts? Okay, that's probably not true. But if there's a chance that it is, do you really want to jinx it? Leave a review. Do it for the young creative in you. Um, so bunk bunkus means wrap up or, or take out in Malay. Uh, so if you're going to a restaurant or a cafe, whether it's a drink or a food item, if you want it to go, you say bunkus and they wrap it up for you. Um, I Whenever I would go back home, I would when I'd, I'd be like going through shops with my mom or with some family and they would say bunkus and I was like, it, it always stuck with me. I was like, there's such a it's an interesting way of like uh, doing business as a, on the customer side. You just say bunkus, they wrap it up quickly and here you go. Um, so I, it, it just always stuck with me. Um, in terms of starting it with my mom, it wasn't that I wanted to just like necessarily start a new business or anything like that. Um, I, I've always loved cooking. I've always had a passion for cooking and have seen a lot of the pain points in terms of like, different businesses where I just saw that a lot a lot of a lot of food business a lot of food establishments I would go to and it was the, the food itself was the quality and the taste of it was just like subpar I'm like there could be a better option out there and like I, I know that we can introduce that um, obviously there's like so many more challenges in running a food business than just like making good tasting food but that was one of the things that got me to like start this but the bigger um the bigger aspect was just spending more time with my mom um she's she's getting older um and we had a rough relationship um for the most part we're usually at each other's necks or like we're like we have we have a lot of love for each other but the communication has always been like it was it hasn't been there so over the past couple of years especially um i've tried to connect with her as much as possible um humanize 
her in, and like her struggles as like a human being and like separate her from just being my mom and see like you know like how like why she does the things that she does um and so like I, I figured, okay, if I did this business with her and we're in the kitchen together, we're going to connect even more. We're spending time together more, um, especially after I moved out where, uh, you know, we're spending even less time together. So I'm like, okay, if, if we're in the business, we're going to, you know, have our, our days uh, together. It's not easy for sure. Um, we still butt heads like all the time <laughs> in the kitchen, but um it's something that we're working on, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how I started Don Cusas. They, they have a saying, I guess, or I guess maybe it's not a saying. It's just something I noticed, which is quality time comes from quantity of time. So, yeah, like you said, if you spend that time, there will be pockets of quality of time, hopefully. Yeah. And um, the second thing is, I'm getting to a phase of my life as well where, you know, some things you kind of do when you're younger, when you're kind of learning, you kind of save some opportunities, and you know, you kind of kind of go down that path however far however however far it goes mm -hmm. but I have a new philosophy which is you know uh, especially now as a parent and I think just kind of getting older of you know try to find creative ways to spend time with the ones you love so in your case like whether it's like starting a business you know uh, playing a sport together you know finding a common interest um, just like for the reasons you kind of describe right like wh whether it's friends family um, because I think in this day and age I, I you know, it's not like you watch these TV shows like Friends and like all these other older like sitcoms and like everyone seems to kind of spontaneously get together. And at least in Toronto or like I guess a lot of these bigger cities and like this current age we live in, it's really hard to, I think, spend time with your loved ones unless it's kind of scheduled or planned and yeah. or like there's something kind of bringing you together. I think for guys especially and I think like um, men in general, like friendships or like say um, other kinds of male relationships it's I think sports or like some kind of common interest that brings people together mm -hmm. um, and in other cases it could be like building a business or whatever so 100% I, I love kind of that answer in terms of you know the two businesses that you have um, have you been able to take any um, learnings from Litz because obviously that's been around longer and applied to Bungus Bungus Yes. Uh, they, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, because like by the time I started Bunkus, um, yes. it was already like almost five years into Lits, and uh, I I took a lot of the marketing skills that I and the social media skills and like posting and things like that um, from Lits and applied that to Bunkus. I realized I over time as the business grew in Lits and I was just running in between every uh, possible department um, for for lids, I had less time to spend interacting with my customers and that experience. And that was really important for me from the get go is I, I wanted to provide a better customer experience. It's, it's, um, I, I feel like that's even more important than the product itself. Um, so while growing Bunkus, I made sure to incorporate a sort of educational aspect into Bunkus because a lot of people aren't really familiar with Malaysian food or Malaysia in general. I, I, every so often I'll, I'll throw in like a poll or I'll throw in like a, uh, did you know, so-and-so. Um, and I found that like a lot of people were like really engaged with just learning, um, about a new culture, about a new cuisine, about Malaysia in general. And, uh, they saw that the, like the passion was there. Um, and so in the one, one and a half years that I've had Bunkus, like we've been able to grow it at a much faster rate and in terms of like social media uh, presence, like we've been able to grow it at a much faster rate than I've been able to grow lits in like five years. And that was mainly through the engagement and the customer interactions that I've had um, through like serving at events, but also like on social media itself. That was probably like the biggest thing that I took brought over from lids to to bunkus um as well as like some of the business processes to be able to like uh have more uh structure in terms of my like schedule things like that you have plans to offer lit sauces or incorporate it into the uh, bunkus uh, pus, uh menu yeah definitely um so yeah uh, 
in about a month actually um uh, september 12th yeah in about a month um we're gonna launch a co-branded uh hot sauce um onto the lids lineup but it'll be also part of Blinkus's lineup um it's a uh, malaysian sambal uh it's been doing really well while we're like serving it on the side at Blinkus. people have been loving it and they've been asking for um you know like if i can purchase it in a jar and stuff so uh that's going to be the first co-branded product between the two brands uh it'll also be our first super hot flavor on the lips lineup uh that's also something people have been asking for for a long time so i'm really excited about that so with bungus um where like where can uh, people get the food like are you guys like in a physical store or are you guys on like the delivery apps like where, where can somebody get the food yeah um so Besides events, which I always post on our Instagram about, um, we recently got into a shared kitchen uh, space called East York Eats uh, Food Hall. It's right by Eglinton and Laird. Um, it's at 858 Eglinton Avenue East. Um, so it's a space where uh, myself, there's a there's a pizza vendor, a patty vendor, a few different vendors in there um, sharing the same kitchen space. Uh, people can order uh, either in person walking in for a pickup or dine-in. There's also small dine-in space. Um, but you can also find us on uh, the apps. Um, so uh, we started on and heavily use um, this new app called Cookin'. Um, I don't know if you I don't know if you heard about it, but it's uh, it started off as like introducing like home cooks onto uh, a delivery platform. Um, so before we even had a shop, we were using that, um, through like rental spaces that we had, that was, that's the main one that we use. And then we're also on Uber Eats. Um, we're about to launch on a couple new platforms within the next month or so. Uh, yeah, you can, you can order for takeout. You can come in, uh, pick up, uh, we also do catering as well for events. Taking some notes because I'll be ordering from Uber Eats because it's a, it's a little this a little far for me, but I'll definitely I think order and maybe pick up or get it delivered. We'll figure it out. Yeah, for sure. But the key question is, and maybe I'm just asking a personal question here: Can someone with a shellfish allergy eat any of the food on your menu? Hundred percent. Yeah. Um, we, like if if you. Do what do you have, recommend? What do you like recommend? What's like the go to, like option on your menu? So we have like we have halal chicken options. We have veg options. Um, you, you pretty much any. Yeah, pretty much anything on our menu right now, like it can be, uh, it can be tweaked to your preference. And if you have an allergy like that, especially if it's like an uh, extreme one, like I do warn people that you're still in an environment that, you know, it's been cooked in the same environment. But like I have multiple walks, so I'll just use one that I haven't used for any shrimp products, or um, that's pretty much the only shellfish that that's even there is just shrimp. Um, right. But yeah, that would that would be the alternative. I'm sold. I will be, uh, my brother-in-law is, uh, going to be visiting. So he's always looking for good food spots. So, awesome. uh, we're going to be hitting up your spot. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Come through anytime. What's uh, what's a piece of advice you wish you got or somebody told you when you first started your businesses that you wish you knew? Mm, don't start it alone. Um, it's very difficult and time consuming to run a family or run a business on your, uh, on your own, especially when you need to scale up. Um, cause there's only so much time and energy you have as one person and you'll get burnt out quickly if you're wearing every hat for too long. So definitely, uh, don't do that right, right out. If anything, I would say like, write out your idea or like a rough business plan in as much detail as possible and, um, pitch it to, you know, somebody you trust or somebody that you, that you want to grow this business with long uh, and somebody that you think is going to be there for long term. Um, obviously you can't. Uh, can't assume everyone's going to be permanently there forever. But um, yeah, I would say it started, started off that way. And, and uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a lot easier when you have more people involved. Um, the right people though. What's a, uh, I guess a failure you experienced in say like the last couple of years during kind of this entrepreneurial journey. And like, what did you learn from that failure? Um, can't think of like one in particular because there's, as you're starting a business from the ground up, there isn't like, like no amount of books or like podcasts or people that you listen to can like make everything go perfectly and go according to plan. Um, uh, the life cycle of a business isn't linear either. So um, there's, there's been like a bunch of like different like mistakes, some cost more costly than others. Like 
It could be from, you know, ordering the wrong size of bottle to, you know, using the wrong full packer or, uh, you know, the, there, there's a bunch of like learning process mistakes um, that I've, that I've had, but they were all part of the learning process in, in general. And I think I have like a lot more experience and expertise because of it, because I know like where you could go wrong. And in that way, I can advise other newcomers coming into like the entrepreneurial space of like, you know, maybe, maybe think about that a little bit longer or like, you know, uh, focus on this uh, a bit more. Um, yeah, I, I would say like, just in terms of like learning from those mistakes is just, um, you know, keeping them in mind and trying not to repeat them uh, again. Yeah, one thing as you're speaking, for me, like a learning in general that it's not specific, like you said, I think I thought the impact of mistakes was would be permanent, but, you know, everything, you can overcome pretty much anything, like, yeah. even, if, even if you think it's like a huge uh, mistake, that's like, uh, you know, insurmountable, like it always is, it just takes time and effort yeah. and like your will so uh, i love that advice that you gave or i guess the experience that you just talked about um i guess if you had a chance to go back in a 16 year old time machine and talk to 16 year old karthi what would you tell him tell him a lot <laughs> money can be hard to come by but here is a hundred dollar opportunity for you join my free newsletter for free exclusive content and a free chance to win a hundred dollars when i hold special draws did i mention that it's free i would say definitely like don't overthink too much um, take more risks, uh, prioritize the people that prioritize you. Um, I've like having gone through the experiences that I have, I'm in my head pretty often. So, um, and that stops me from doing a lot of the things that I want to do. Um, so I would just say like, yeah, don't, don't overthink. That's, that would be my biggest advice to my uh, younger self. In terms of your personal legacy in a few sentences, like how would you want to be remembered by your family and friends? Wow. It's, it's almost like uh, saying like my own eulogy or something. <laughs> yeah. well, that's why I like asking the question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's a good one. Um, I would say like uh, how I'd want to be remembered is like someone that wasn't afraid to push the envelope on what you can and can't do. Um, someone that inspired others to pursue their dreams um, without worrying about like status quo or societal norms or like what your family will uh, wants you to do or what you think you sh should be doing or anything like that. Um, be as uh, like someone that was as genuine and true to myself as possible. Um, and someone who cares for like the happiness and adding value to people's lives more than the material things and money. Well said. And that's kind of a good segue into the last uh, part of the podcast. It's a, a speed round game that I like to call Creator Confessions. Okay. I'm basically going to say a bunch of statements and you tell me the first thing that pops to mind. Ready? Sounds good. Favorite Tamil food? Favorite Tamil food? Um, Kota roti. Something that scares you? Something that scares me? Uh, future. Um, if there's some kind of like fire flood, whatever it is, like you don't, you have time to grab two things with you. What are they? Uh, oh my God. Uh, I don't... Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's an insecurity that you have? An insecurity that I have. Um, that uh, I have like imposter syndrome uh, many times just uh, through like lack of experience on uh, in some field. Favorite TV show you're watching? Um, probably One Piece. A place you're itching to travel to? Oh, uh, Italy. Favorite, uh, sorry, a fellow Tamil creator you want to give a shout out to? Oh, uh, Kitchen Girl. A favorite childhood memory? The time I came back face painted uh, like a tiger and I was like, I think I was like five years old or something. Um, took a uh just came uh, came back and like growled at my mom and she was just like uh pretending to be scared or whatever it is that's like a fun playful moment but i remember it like vividly that's awesome uh favorite movie of all time it could be tamil english or both tamil would probably be like jeans or Pariyapa. um english there's too many <laughs> <laughs> um what's a decision you've been putting off for a while uh it, i finally made the decision but the decision was um uh, to uh, go to to go back to Malaysia, um, just book a flight uh, back to Malaysia. It's been like five years, and uh, finally that's going to be happening very soon. I guess you're going back for some inspiration as well for the business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm awesome. gonna do like a little vlog series. That's take awesome. you on the journey with me. 
I will pick your brain on that because I want to go to Malaysia. Yeah, for sure. Um, who's somebody you'd love to have on your invisible personal council? Like you could pick their brain whenever and like just have access to them. Uh, probably my old uh, uh, senior VP of sales. Uh, he, he's 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 a really solid dude and he has like a lot of experience and a great personality. And yeah, I would uh, definitely love to be able to pick his brain anytime I want. What's a purchase you've made that you splurged on in the last couple of years that you have no regret about? Uh, I think you asked me this before for the website, but it's, it's still the same. Um, it's uh, probably my all clad um, set for uh, like my stainless steel pod. Uh, what's a pet peeve of yours? Pet peeve? Um, people that uh, try to put on a front um, to uh, to be liked more. If you uh, knew that you were going to die tomorrow, a regret that you would have? Not having spent as much time uh, with certain relationships as I should have. A celebrity whose life you'd want to experience just for one day. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a book you've read or a podcast you've listened to that's had an impact on you? A book I've read, um, The Dip uh, by Seth Godin. Um, really good. Uh, as well as, um, uh, what was it? The, the, the Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Shoe Dog was good, yeah. yeah. Although they made him look like a an idiot on um oh the movie yeah i was like this yeah, guy was yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> what yeah. was the movie called why can't i think um, of it? it was it was more around like the jordan uh, yeah acquisition but yeah it wasn't yeah I was it wasn't it wasn't favorable i would say for him yeah. um what's a belief behavior or habit that's improved your life uh wake up in the morning um and instead of just going straight to like the work grind take uh take a few minutes for yourself and like just breathe and take in the day and finally what's the piece of advice you'd give to your fellow aspiring tamil creators out there um don't be afraid to um get out there and just like like put yourself out there um especially like when it comes to networking whether it's within the tamil community or just like in general um you never know like what opportunities are going to come out of that um and think about like especially when it uh if you're trying to uh, approach someone for a decision like the worst case scenario they just say no um the best case you get what it is that you uh went out seeking so like yeah don't don't be afraid to like just uh, act on your on your um uh, ideas i don't mean to make this sound like brag about like me but karthi mentioned that he reached out to a previous podcast uh guest ruben who is obviously a great guy and very successful and he he preaches what he speaks about. He he reached out and you know he built a relationship. So uh, love that advice. Yeah, um, that was that was probably like my first like, uh, or it, it wasn't my first, but like that was one of the times where I really realized like it it doesn't hurt to just message uh, somebody that inspires you or someone that you're trying to connect to. And like worst case, you get left on red or you get a no. But like best case, you gain like a new connection new relationship out of that yeah and i would say like for people i mean this is like unsolicited advice for people but i'll, I'll tell you anyways um, i think when reaching out to people i think a lot of people make it about themselves i always tell people like number one i guess if you reach out to people there should be no expectation they'll respond they don't have to um this is coming from, i think this is coming from like a sales background as well where you're kind of like used to not a lot of people responding and number two is just when you're reaching out to somebody, try to make it like, how can it be mutually beneficial? Or even like, you know, how can you offer them value if you want to yeah, go to the other extreme? I think most people, it's like, hey, I want to talk to you because you can help me with this versus I barely ever mis receive messages from people saying, hey, um, I'd love to help you do this or I think you should talk to this person. Um, when I receive those messages, it's like very memorable. And I, yeah. whether it's like right or not, I have a certain perception of people when they pitch it like that. But yeah. But yeah, no, thanks for jumping on the podcast, Karthi. I, I absolutely loved this conversation just because, like I said, you married two things, food and business. I love talking about both. Um, and I'm glad that you're able to potentially cater to my shellfish allergy so I can try some genuine Malaysian food. So definitely, man. Uh, I so those are you having me. And I'm like super honored that uh, I even got to be a part of your uh, podcast series. No, I mean, I loved your like story when I first heard about it. And obviously, your story has evolved since we first chatted. So um, I love following people's journeys and kind of, you know, these decisions you made. And I think you quitting your job full time and pursuing this, I mean, 
we'll see where it goes, but I think it'll lead to some great things. Um, almost, almost at the full year mark uh, by the end of this month. Yeah, which will be crazy. And I, I want people to, you know, whoever's still listening at this point to uh, go out and buy some hot sauce or go to Bunkus. Bunkus. Did I get it? Bungus, my goodness. What's wrong? <laughs> it's a running joke. I, I'm so bad with it. Bungus. No, you're, you're not the only one. I've I've had to uh, say the pronunciation video like enough times. Bungus. It'll, it'll, it'll eventually catch on. Well, now, now that I know where the name comes from, when I visit Malaysia, I will use that word at least once to get my Definitely. food to go. <laughs> um, well, for those, for anybody listening that's kind of in, you know, inspired by your story, wants to, you know, reach out, um, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Um, you can connect with me over Instagram. Uh, I'm pretty active on both my um, business accounts. Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn as well, um, Karthi Subramaniam. Uh, feel free to email me, Karthi at lostinthesauce.ta. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Karthi. And for the, everyone listening, appreciate you guys listening and sending feedback, all that good stuff. On to the next episode. Mm-hmm.